is Colin Mockery, and you're listening to Dispatch Radio. All right, we got a great young actor on with us. We're going to talk about some of his great projects that are coming up, including including a uh, great role on the new CBS show Extant that stars Halle Berry. His name is Emmy Eck Walker. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastic. How are it, you? Uh, very blessed, and it's great to get a chance to talk to you. This is a, an exciting show that's uh, just started, and uh, you've got a great role on there as uh, one of the one of the SWAT members and that kind of thing. So tell everybody a little bit about what it's like being on the show. Being on the show was great. You're just surrounded by so many ambitious minds. Um, you know, with ex- uh, executive producer uh, Halle Berry and Steven Spielberg, you, everybody up there is just upping their game, and they're just out there trying to create the best project possible. Um, and that's just the energy that it was like being on that set. Um, yeah, everybody, everybody was great, and it was just a very creative um, environment being on set. What was uh, some of the uh, the advice that you may have gotten or run into working with some of these uh, these these great talented folks? Um, one of the best advice that I could say was actually from Michael O'Neill, who was on set, and he said one of the best things that you can do in regards to he was talking about like Robert De Niro and so many other people, like the stuff that they work on the most, just relaxation, um, was the biggest thing. It's you know it's just going um, and just relax. Like all the work has basically been taken care of. You just got to go up there and present yourself and just do what you need to do and not overthink, just, just relax. And that's what I saw a lot. That's just his work and other people on set as well. Something like this, as far as uh, you know, a sci-fi project like this, is have a, describe the the multitude of like moving parts. There's a whole lot of different things that are happening here. This is a much bigger production than some people may realize. Yeah, it is. Um, I think you just see how much of a production value um, that is involved with these projects. You just see so many different departments working. You've got, you know, special effects teams. You've got just so many numbers and so many hands on sets. It's different than your, you know, standard smaller projects that you see. It's definitely an exciting time for you, and definitely a show that we'll keep an eye on. Uh, CBS is extant with uh, Halle Berry, and um, it's obviously not the only thing that you're working on. I really wanted to ask you about this um, thriller that you have coming up that you work with uh, Joe Johnstone on, and that is uh, Not Safe for Work. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, Not Safe for Work. Um, It actually just came out uh, in April. Um, and you guys working with him, especially his mind as well, um, especially with doing the original uh, Captain America. Um, it's an exciting project, so is our Max Mangiela, uh, as well as the lead in J.J. Feld. Um, on there, I uh, actually play accomplice to the killer, and then at the end of the movie, you realize that I'm actually a cop the entire time. Oh, a little spoiler alert for you there, guys. Uh, little spoiler alert. Little, little, little. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. It's called Not Safe for Work, folks. And uh, we'll definitely keep your eye on trying to get a viewing of that so you can catch that as well. And, uh, yeah, you know, you mentioned Joe's work on Captain America. And, you know, did he really have much, you know, to, to say to you about that? I mean, how do you, how do you describe someone that's like this? Because he kind of – he doesn't have that high-profile reputation that other names uh, sort of get, yet he's produced just such an amazing resume of work. Mm-hmm. I think when you work on these projects, you always imagine these people having bigger than life personalities. Um, but you get on set, and these people, especially Joe, and just a lot of these people on set, especially working with uh, Ali as well on Extend, is like these people are some of the most down to earth people that you'll ever see. Um, some of the nicest people, some of the most humble people that you see and come to face. It's it's actually pretty um, relaxing at the end of the day. How is uh how has Emmy changed through all of this? How are you different now coming out the other side of these uh, couple big projects like that? Um, it's actually funny because I actually having something earlier this year. So I think the biggest thing that I've really realized is what's the worst that could happen. You know what I mean? And I think first off, just in terms of LA, I think one of the biggest challenges at first for many people, I think it's just moving out here. And I think as soon as you move out here that biggest step that you have to take has already been made. And then everything else after that is just, you know, work and trial and error. And I think from this point on, I just realized this, you just got to take that chance. At some point, I just feel that you have to go all in. Um, I've said this one thing that the biggest thing and the only thing that you can't medicate is purpose. 
um, meaning, you know, deep inside of you, you're going to feel like if you're not pursuing what you're supposed to be doing, it's going to catch up to you and you can't run from it. Um, so I realized just, you know, if you feel that urge inside of you, just, just go for it, just do it. And then I always say that if the biggest issue that you can face is a first world problem, meaning you might have to get a job or whatever it is, some side thing, whatever, go for that risk and take it. And I think that's just one of the biggest models that I've taken is just do what feels right inside of you. Don't be afraid. I want to transition over to a uh, a short film that you had a great chance to work on. You produced and starred in it. It's called Chance. I think it's going to be making the rounds on some of the fall festivals and that kind of thing. Or uh, give everybody a little bit of how this kind of came together and, and the passion that you had to bring this to life. Um, yeah, that actually kind of is a perfect follow-up. Is That was the film that made me realize a lot. Um, it made me realize, okay, I guess I'll start off. Uh, so I worked on the project with a buddy of mine who I'm actually in another feature with called Looking for Lions. Um, and with that one, uh, I wrote a project based on a previous idea that I had about a feature that I was working on. Um, and it's just basically about these random occurrences that happen with chance encounters. Um, and what happens is this guy, he's downtown, he meets this girl. And when he meets this girl, he has a you just kind of see their night moving along, you know, like um, hanging out, doing all these different things. And then at the end of the night, you realize that he actually never even talked to her. Um, and then it made me realize, <laughs> it was actually kind of funny, it made me realize that, you know, this character is living in a consistent state of regret. Um, and it made me, and, that, and I guess it was kind of a take on myself at the same time. And I, I remember watching it, I and mean, we watched it about 50 times. And then after the 51st time, I started crying, just started bawling. Then I watched it again, started bawling in the exact same spot. And, and it just makes you realize that you got to take those chances. So that at the end of the day, you're just going to keep dreaming. You know, like how long can you dream for before you take an action? Well, and I think, I think actually, it fits well with what you said earlier, right, about just stepping out and finding your purpose and then going with it. Yeah, and I think that's what happened, because like right before I produced, I had a I had a day job, actually. And I remember right after that, I'm like, I'm going to quit my day job into nothing, and I'm going to focus and put 100% of my efforts into acting. And at that point, I didn't have any like jobs lined up. Like, heading into 2014, I had nothing lined up. Like, and... I quit, had no savings at all. And then basically, if you kind of see, you know, kind of what's been happening, it's been, it took off as soon as I took that chance. Well, and definitely that. And I want to get to your thoughts and experiences because you've had a lot of great opportunities to appear on some different shows. And, and when mm -hmm. you step out and, and you make that move, it's great to see that manifest itself rather quickly. You know, you had a Hawaii Five O and Castle and some different things. And, you know, what was what was going through your mind, you know, when you get that first you know, that first really big gig, you know, because here you are, you're trying to, you know, go through audition after audition after audition. Sometimes you may not even hear back right away. So your head's just almost keeping you up at night. Like, man, I got to have a shooter drop here. What was it like having the first one? And then what is it like now trying to kind of juggle everything? Um, it's actually funny. Actually, it was a uh, castle, um, Hawaii Five-O and Expand that I all booked within the same week. Oh, wow. Um, so basically like, yeah, I, uh, I went into castle and I auditioned for that. Uh, the next day I heard that I booked it. Um, then after that, when I was shooting, when I was shooting an episode of, uh, castle, I actually had an audition for Hawaii Five-O and I couldn't go to the audition for Hawaii Five-O. So after I got upset, I made a self tape and sent it over to them. And then I found out the next day that I booked Hawaii Five O. And then uh, the same day that I found out I booked Hawaii Five O, I had an audition for Extant. I had an initial audition for Extant. And then the next day I had to shoot another project, just a side project. And I realized that they wanted me back for a callback for Extant, but I couldn't go because I was already booked on a project and I couldn't leave. And then I found out later on about the next day that they booked me up for my initial audition. Wow. Feast your family, my friend. 
Well, <laughs> feast or famine, right? Just keeps rolling. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I booked all of them within within the same like three or four days, which was which was heaven sent. Was amazing. It was a great feeling. What is it like, you know, when you when you when you look back and you made that transition from, you know, you did the you did the film Inc., which everybody just loves to death. Back, you know, one of the great films of two thousand nine, and you look back to that mm-hmm. initial desire to kind of, you know, pursue this. Um, how do you reflect on that and try to keep yourself honest and pure? And how do you see yourself kind of moving forward? What What are the things that you're really interested in continuing to work on? Well. Going back on Inc., uh, which was probably one of the most influential projects I've done, um, just because it was, it was like a small independent film back in Colorado, which if you <laughs> if you actually look at the film of, of Inc., you realize that there's almost every red flag known to man um, going into it. It's like, all right, so we're going to do a science fiction film um, where the director is going to be producing it, editing it, composing it first time he's composing from no name actors from uh Colorado um and then ends up being in some people's favorite film of 2009 um that experience humbled me not really because of making it but because of what happened after um it was basically just grassroots marketing that we had to do like the five about five to seven of us of the main actors and the director and the his wife um who actually did uh, the sound for the movie, sound editing. We literally launched this project from a simple trailer and pushing it out to our friends to basically a few months down the road for it to be at some point, at one point, the most downloaded movie in the world. So at some point, it was like one of the most popular movies in the world. And it made me realize that you can't sit back and wait for somebody else to push your project or push something that you believe in. Like you have to stand behind it and you have to push it, and you have to believe in it. Um, and then, at the same time, that movie also told me, since this guy was doing it all on himself, his, uh, his own, it made me get into you know writing, directing, producing, editing, even playing with music as well. Um, well, it's kind of, in hindsight, made me produce Chance, the film that I did as well, and some other projects too. Well, folks, Emmy has um, another interesting story to tell. He is... Um a triplet. He has a twin and a, uh, and, and a sister, Obi, uh, his twin is AK and, um, brother, I, I tracked you down pretty quickly cause you know, you have a unique name. So it didn't take long to uh, catch the, uh, are you smarter than a fifth grader episode? Oh, stop. oh gosh. And, oh. and I have to say, <laughs> you, you probably have a little bit of bragging rights with AK, right? Cause I mean, no offense to AK, but he made some kind of blunderous moves, man. He kept kind of shooting you in the foot. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 could, I could call on my brother right now and say that he didn't know that penguins were birds. I know. Um, um, and the, the, best, the best part of that scene, folks, is, you know, the question is, if penguins are birds, true or false, he is so confident that they are not birds. And the little girl is just looking at him like, what is wrong with you? It's fantastic. And poor Emmy. <laughs> Emmy's just left there like, well, it's not my turn. I can't really say or do anything. Oh, uh, yeah. It was... It was <laughs> It's a great clip. I have to be perfectly honest. Yeah, and I, I think the issue is they wouldn't let us talk to one another. It's like if we so it was a twins edition, and if they would have let us talk to one another, I don't think we would have missed. No, no, we would have missed one question because one question is literally impossible. Um, Louisiana I, Purchase, eighteen oh three. Yeah, that one. I was like, yeah. who, who knows the exact yeah. date of that? If you are, congrats to you. Um, but if we would have been able to speak to one another. I think we would have done great, but I can't, I can't, it's tough because that was such a tough moment for me um, because he did miss those two, but then I missed the question, which made us lose all of the money, like yeah. all of it. Yeah. At least he, at least he's confessing with us honest. Emmy, Emmy sent him home Emmy, and, and Emmy, Emmy finished him off. So it's kind of how it went down. I finish. I, I finish it off, and it's funny because it's like they show it with an like the final moment. We were supposed to say, you know, our two minds aren't smarter than a fifth grader. That was really about like a twenty minute take because it was so tough for us to accept the fact that we were walking <laughs> away with nothing. 
<laughs> like, it was tough. It was tough. And you know what? Actually, when I think about it, we were actually smarter than the fifth grader or as smart because the fifth grader also missed the question as well. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Well, let me ask, though. What is what is happening on the show? Because it, go, it goes to commercial breaks a lot, and it's kind of, you know, does Foxworthy cut up with you a little bit, try to keep you relaxed and loose, or does he just kind of do his own thing? Or how, what's happening behind the scenes? Everybody watches a show like this. They think they can do it. But once you're in the moment, the tension's there, the lights are on you, whatever. What What is the, the other part of the story? Here's, going to actually the, the hidden thing about these game shows, which is which is really tough, is – that you're not you're not guaranteed to get the money. Like even if you do win, you're not guaranteed to get it unless you are exciting. Um, so let's just say you do win, and you weren't exciting, and they don't air your episode, you don't see any of it. Right. So, well, that makes it so much different because you have to have this type of energy the entire time. And that's why I always wonder, like, why is that person going for the million dollars? But they could bank the money because they're not guaranteed to get the money. Right. They're excited. So we were, I remember right before shooting, um, me and my brother know each other just so well. Of course, we're twins. So I remember me and my brother were sitting in the green room, just basically almost like sleeping. We were just laying back. And then the producers kept coming in and just like, you got to, like, come on. They were trying to, like, pump us up. We are trying to pump us up. And my friend was in the room. And he's like, trust me. Trust me, they will be fine. They will be fine. Just let them relax. And then as soon as you turn on the cameras, me and my brother, we just take off. Like, I think we actually run into the audience and, like, start running upstairs and stuff. I didn't see so, that part, but you definitely run around the stage at one point. I'm like, whoa, where are they going? <laughs> <laughs> we're, running around, we're running around like crazy. We're slapping hands. We're getting people hugged. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep up the energy the entire time. Like, we were just like, we wanted to make sure that we controlled the energy in that room. Um, so there wasn't actually anything that uh, Jeff Boxer was, was doing. We're kind of like feeding off of each other, which was really cool, which I think when you see the final moment of what happens, why it's so heartbreaking, it's because I feel that you kind of wanted us to win. And, you know, we walked away with like 100 bucks that we had to split between the two of us. <laughs> behind the scenes with <laughs> are you smarter than a fifth grader there you go folks what a what a great story but your family obviously when you have a twin and a, you know a triplet really with your sister how um people always say oh, i'm close and i'm whatever how close really are you i mean you guys i finish the other sentences um we just we just know each other. I think it's weird because I also I also have three older brothers as well. So we have a we have a big family. Um, it's weird because I just always had that connection. And you know, it's like some people ask you, you know, how does it feel being a triplet? I was like, I don't know any different. You know, right. Um, the the I remember one thing though, which is kind of cool, is I've always known how to talk and which it sounds funny in my mind i've always known how to talk because since me my brother and my sister were talking with one another, we probably weren't speaking english we probably were speaking jibber jab but we understood each other because i remember later on my brother was like you guys would just like yell at each other and just say jokes to one another and just laugh and giggle and <laughs> even though we're speaking baby talk um and i think it's we've always established with the three of us and even our whole entire family, we're all extremely close that we would always do anything for one another. Um, with my brother too, I could say that my brother is like my partner in crime. My twin brother is my partner in crime because, you know, being a twin, we would switch classes. It, on my, <laughs> play jokes on people is fun. Like I would, we would still do it today if we had the chance to switch out. Oh, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Like we have, which has probably made me have to say, funny, mischievous mind that I would consistently and always just play jokes on other people. And that hasn't stopped. That, I don't think that will ever stop in me playing jokes in, on, on other people. Has AK confessed that he's like, you know, riding your wave a little bit, like running around in like an extant t-shirt or something like that saying, hey, you see me on TV last night? <laughs> <laughs> um... I don't know. I guess I got to see what happens when it, when, it, when it comes to when it comes to uh, my introduction of my character. You know, um, the person who's actually my biggest supporter is my sister. I know my sister will be doing it because my sister, my sister actually gets more excited for the projects that I do than 
anybody else. Can't believe I just called out your twin brother on my radio show, and your brother's like, what are you talking about? I wasn't on the radio. Yes, you were, bro. You were there. We were to your topic of discussion on my show. <laughs> Oh, Emmy, it's been great talking with you, my friend, and it is just awesome to uh, see the projects rolling in and things going really well for you, and I hope that we'll be able to continue to talk in the future. Um, folks, Emmy Ickwalker, uh, you will catch Extant. That is on CBS. He's coming up in a few episodes. I think you have at least three? Uh, yeah, I have at least three. At least three episodes, and of course, there's other projects out there. We'll try to link to some of that, and I will promise him that I won't link to the or embed the uh, "Are you smarter than a fifth grader?" I'll let the audience figure that out on their not, own. Not, the not. audience will figure it out on their own if they're so ambitious. But uh, it is good talking with you, and uh, hope you continue to do well, my friend. Absolutely. Thanks so much for talking with you as well. All right. Take care. All right. Take care.